When it comes to Yamaha 125s, I'm guessing you sit in one of two camps. The old and bold out there are thinking about RD125s, TZR125s, and the young guys will probably have a phone in their pocket with a picture of the latest, greatest R1 as the screensaver. Regardless of which camp you sit in, we all know there's only one way to ride a 125. That's with your chin on the tank, the cable stretched tight, and the thing absolutely flat out. More than just class leading, this is a genuine bestseller for Yamaha, and if they want to continue that success, this 2019 version better be good. I could have carried on towering over this bike, but it doesn't really do it any favors. It's a 125, it's tiny, so we thought if I sit down here, it looks massive all the way up there. 1140 millimeters from ground to the top of the bike, the highest part of the bike, and also only 142 kilograms ready to ride. I've ridden bikes with tool kits that weigh more than this thing. When Yamaha recommend that you buy a lock and chain for it, it's not just to stop the little shits from stealing it out of your garage. If you don't tether this thing down, chances are it's just gonna float away on the wind. In size and stature, this 2019 model has grown in all but two areas. Seat height is down five mil to 820 millimeters, and the wheelbase has shrunk to 1325 millimeters from 1350. If you're the mum or dad that's gonna bankroll one of these things, stick around, I'll tell you what you're gonna get for your money. If you're the lucky kid that's gonna get to ride one of these things to college, stick around, I'll tell you how that feels too. There's a host of new changes with this bike, mostly mechanical, some of them just slight tweaks to things like the brakes. We'll work our way through those things and then I'll tell you how it feels to ride. So this caliper here, four piston, you will have seen before, it's the one from the previous gen R125 radial mount with ABS. So what they've done is changed the pads, upgraded them to a better performing pad. They've also rerouted the cables up to the lever. It's a simple fork set, unadjustable at the top. It does little more than hold the front wheel and brake in place. We rode it flat out on track and flat out everywhere else really, but the forks were really good everywhere. What Yamaha has decided to do is focus on the other end and the changes that they've done at the top of the fork set. So the top yoke now holds bars that are slightly more open and more relaxed to hold on to, and more importantly, the aesthetic matters to the target market for this bike. So the new top yoke on this looks exactly the same as the one on your dad's R1. The clock set has also benefited from some fairly major upgrades. Granted, there isn't a thousand riding modes to navigate through. It's quite a simple to read system. The general look and feel of it is as part of the R series family. It looks and feels like an R1, it really does. And also when you flick this one on, is the perfect opportunity for you to slip a swear word in. It'll give you a hello greeting and a goodbye greeting, or it'll just say tits. That R-Series DNA continues back from the notched section in the headstock onto the tank. Now got those little vents in the side, just like an R1. Really cool touch, I think. Remember this target market is 17 to 25 years old, and this sector are bound by different constraints to the ones that maybe you and I were bound by when we were that age. So apart from the fact that I didn't even have a license when I was 17, if you're passing your test on one of these now, you're capped at 15 horsepower, I think. So this thing makes 14.35 horsepower. Every single number matters in power and torque terms. And if you can't win there, the only other way you can win market share at this end of the market is by making the thing look cool. That's why this thing looks so much like Big Brother R3, R6, and R1. In between those sweet vents, up on the top of the tank, Yamaha has notched a center section for you to put your chin on the tank and go absolutely flat out. Remember, that's what this sector of the market is all about, learning your trade, getting a little bike like this wound up to as fast as it will go and keeping it there for as long as possible. They've achieved that at the same time as somehow increasing the comfort levels as well. So in splaying the bars out and giving you a slightly more relaxed position for your hands, the seat height, despite it being lower, is also more comfortable. They've completely reshaped the seat. It's a more comfortable place to sit and the pegs are easier to get at as well. The aim is for you to be more comfortable than you would have been on the previous model but also to be able to go faster than you could on the previous model. Who wouldn't want to go on a bike like that? The swing arm that you can't see behind me has been updated on this model over the old one. A couple of important changes. It's wider than it used to be, and it's now ribbed for extra pleasure and stiffness. 
One more thing before we get to the motor, the tail end of the bike again has been reworked to fit into the R-Series family. You would be forgiven at 100 meters for looking at the back end of this thing and thinking that you're looking at a new R6 or a new R1. So as I said earlier, license dictates power output with 125s. 14.75 is all you're allowed to get. What Yamaha has achieved is a slight increase in torque and the way that they've achieved that is very, very clever. Not only have they increased the size of the valve seats, not only have they coated everything that moves inside the motor with a, a friction reducing coating to reduce pumping losses and improve efficiencies, they've doubled the size of the airbox and ion. This little bike has variable valve timing now, it's called VVA, it stands for Variable Valve Actuation. The way that VVA works is relatively simple, up to 7400 revs you have the low lift cam at 7.4, little light comes on the dash to let you know that you've activated VVA, you won't feel it, there's no sudden kind of screaming for the horizon, changing performance for the bike. It just allows you to maximize every single one of the revs that this bike has all the way up to the red line. And when you're on a 125 and it only makes 14.7 horsepower, every single rev matters. To complement the changes Yamaha has made to the motor, they've also upped the gearing by adding four teeth to the rear sprocket. What that gives us is, in Yamaha speak, a claimed top speed of over 120 kilometers an hour. What that gave us out there in the real world when we were riding in this weird old man middle-aged slipstreaming 125 death race from hell was a real world 144, 145 k's an hour on the clock so that's getting on for 80 miles an hour. If you're a young lad, ignore the next bit. It's not a TZR125, it won't hit 100 miles an hour easily, times have changed and things have moved on. If you are a young lad, get excited about this bike. I'm going to hedge my bets and say this is probably, in top speed terms, the quickest production 125 that money can buy. So in riding terms, what do all those changes equate to? I can say now, round town, particularly one that you don't know, let's say, I don't know, crazy Wednesday morning Valencia City in January, it's a much easier bike to ride than the old one. You chug through the gears, chuck a load of revs at it, it quite quickly builds up to a speed that would A, keep you in front of lots of other traffic, and B, hurt you if you get it wrong. Don't kid yourself, just because it's a 125, 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, it still hurts just the same regardless of what bike you're on. So you've got to take your time on it and go steady just to get your eye in. Round town, I was really pleased with how easy it was to maneuver. It might have been something to do with those relaxed, slightly splayed out bars. I could see over the tops of cars. There's a reason why so many kids like riding these, and it's not just because they look cool. They're fairly capable in town. Don't be surprised if you end up getting done by one of these this summer in town. On any piece of road straighter and longer than the average football pitch, you'll find yourself quite quickly wound out in top gear with your chin in that new notch in the petrol tank, chasing the bike in front and trying to eke out every single mile an hour that you can. This is A, great fun, and B, exactly what this bike was built to do. Handily for us, that's how we spent most of the day, and it is still just as much fun as it used to be when we were kids. So in practical terms, the changes made to this bike over the old one seem to work. I mean, when you happen to find yourself at a tight and twisty Spanish go-kart track, you can let your hair down and go and have some fun, just like we did. What was it like? It was loads of fun. Because we were all on the same size machines, we were getting into slower versions of exactly the same dices that you would get into with your mates at a regular track day. Quite a lot more feel than I expected through the front brake lever and a great relationship with the front tyre. I didn't really use the back brake lever and the shock was just doing what it wanted to out there. I was quite happy with the performance from the back end of the bike and there was no real danger of me overcoming that sticky Michelin tyre with 14.7 horsepower. But like I say, carrying some lean deep into corners, even carrying a little bit of front brake was fine. And as soon as you let go of that brake, pin to the stop in, mostly third, bags of fun, plenty of knee down, all of the fun and thrills that you would usually get on a track day, just in a smaller, slightly slower, and slightly easier to manage package than an R6 or a 750. Fundamentally, that's exactly what this bike is supposed to deliver. What Yamaha wants to do is put you onto that trajectory, have a 125, upgrade to a 300, 
then go to R6, then go to R1. It's important along the way though that you also consider the bikes that this one is competing against. Aprilia, KTM, Kawasaki, Suzuki and Honda all offer a viable alternative to the R125. And what none of those bikes can do is claim to have anything like the sales success that this has had in the past. There's a perfectly good reason for that. It's a very, very capable bike for the money. But that success can't just be about street cred and performance. There's something else that Yamaha has that's brought an audience and plonked them on this bike. And that's something else for me is quite obvious. And it's the Rossi factor. The guy's been around for ages. He's an absolute superhero in Yamaha's eyes and in everyone else's eyes as well. Would I buy one? Not for me. I'm too old, too fat, and I've been spoiled with 180 horsepower sports bikes for the last five or six years. So no, this isn't the bike for me. The question that matters to me more is, would I buy one for my daughter when she's ready to ride? I think I would. This to me represents everything that new bikers should aim for. It's the perfect 125. It's got its own standalone heritage. It's got a decade's worth of sales success. And I think it more than justifies that £4,499 price tag.